Thank you. Thank you, sir. So welcome back participant. We are starting the second session for day one. The second session will be delivered by uh, Mr. Vinod Bhusa sir. Uh, uh, Vinod Bhusa sir is going to cover the topic that is power ISA versus RISV V comparison. Uh, Vinod Bhusa sir is a senior engineer at <coughs> IBM Systems and Power ISI architecture as an expert. He developed tool for the post silicon validation and he has developed the technical talks, uh, many technical talks about the power ISA in open power IBM power workshops and conferences. With this small introduction, we would like to invite Vinod sir in this platform to please uh, start with the session. Vinod sir, over to you, sir. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Good morning. Yeah, thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Okay, uh, so I think after the Peter C session about open power is say, you know, I would I would go after it into little more internals and then this session uh, should help, you know, if we go and uh, study open ISA, it should help us to get educated and it should help us to uh, learn more from the instruction set architecture. So the the general overview of my talk basically in instruction set architecture there are uh, three books involved in the instruction set architecture so i would i would go and give a an high level overview and then uh, discuss a little bit about memory modeling a memory model uh, of the computer hardware of power implementation like weak ordering versus strong ordering then about uh, sync instructions atomicity then reservation instructions and also touch upon the interrupts. So uh, as we all know, power architecture is open and then we have a compliant uh, instruction set architecture and uh, a previous presenter also has presented it. But what 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 does the power mean? You know, what is the full form of power? Power means power optimization with the enhanced risk. So uh, this is the uh, full form of power. I'm going to book one. Uh, so book one contains everything uh, which an application programmer needs. What all instructions are present, how to access registers, what different kind of units are present, and then co their corresponding instructions and registers. That is what uh, you know. Book one teaches us in instruction set architecture. So it would be like branches, uh, load and store instructions, and when it comes to arithmetic ops, in case of uh, risk architecture, arithmetic ops are only between register to register. Uh, memory is not involved, and then we have fixed point uh, unit, binary floating point, decimal floating point, vector and vector scalar instructions and registers. So I'll go over these things. Then now uh, going to uh, the special purpose registers when we are working on different uh, instructions and uh, instructions corresponding to different units. So we have a condition register. Condition register is, uh, you know, when you compare something condition register gets set and it is used uh, uh, by a lot of fixed point units, reservation reservation instructions, and also even uh, floating point uh, instructions and different condition register field is set. I will also go over it a uh, uh, few slides later. Then we have count register, target ad address register, link register, 
fixed point exception register, floating point status and control register, vector status and control register. So these are all, all different SPRs, which you know we have to be aware when we are working on power instructions at architecture. Like uh, for fixed point exception register, this is uh, this is corresponding to fixed point unit. So if there is an any exception like overflow, underflow. Uh, you know those kind of exception you get the result in this uh, this register similarly there is a floating point status and control register so in this register you can set what rounding mode you want whether you want to round to infinity round to zero you know uh, all of those kind of stuff and whether you want to take an exception whether uh, when a number is not a number in all the i triple standard uh, uh, stuff which we can do so floating point status and control register is way you get the status and you can also control how you want to work on floating point numbers similarly uh, uh, vscr is vector status and control register when you are working on vector instructions similar to fpscr you can control what what do you want to do uh, how do you want to control the numbers uh, you are getting how you want to operate on them and the status of those instructions Uh, moving on to branches. Uh, so there are different kind of branches. Relative branches. Relative branches would be as we would, uh, if you guys have programmed in assembly, you would you would be aware of this. So relative branches would be, you know, you want to branch a few instructions later. So you can tell, you know, I want to branch to four instructions from current from the current instruction or i want to branch to a label label would in turn you know become a, a relative branch of in in case of how the compiler quotes it, it they can also maybe make it absolute branch but generally it would it would be a relative branch so relative branch but then it would have an offset you cannot uh, branch more than uh, a few instructions there would be a limit because the relative offset which you want to branch to it would be coded as part of the instruction so how many ever bits are allocated in the instruction for the relative offset you cannot uh, uh, overflow that relative offset so relative branches uh, that would be the relative branches would be the easiest way to code but then there would be a restriction of uh, you know how many instructions you could uh, a branch off to from the offset then absolute branch absolute branch would be you know you you would it's not related you 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 will branch off to a specific address and then you will have your instructions there that would be absolute branch then there are other kind of branches like a, a main main branch would be using the link register so these these uh, this kind of branches are mainly used in our function calls when we, when we make a new function call or a subroutine call we would uh, you know we would load the link register and branch off to the link register and it also would be used when when we are returning back from the branches then uh, we also have some conditional branches like you know you branch only when a particular condition is uh, met so those would be uh, starting with uh, mnemonic bc and then uh, uh, like uh, the, the places these could be used if we if we map to our programming languages would be for loop or while loop you know all of these loops where you know you would uh, you would uh, loop until a verb in a for loop until some certain number is reached when you increment some number like maybe i 0 to 50 you know till 50 you know you will branch but you have a condition only till 50 you want to branch after that you know you don't want to branch so those would be conditional branches so they they would depend upon so internally branch condition for loops will be implemented using branch condition and they can use different registers how they want to implement one of the register could be ctr count register so whatever we have in the for loop or while loop how many of our times we would want to loop they can load the uh, like uh, the uh, count register ctr and then they'll keep decrementing uh, you know as the loop uh, as the as we loop through and whenever uh, ctr reaches zero then you know you are done with your branching and then you you would uh, not loop anymore on it so there are different uh, uh, there are bo field in this instruction which will help us to you know determine how we want to branch 
then there is another field also in this instruction called uh, AT. AT is a uh, hint. So you can also give a hint whether you know generally this branch will be taken or not. Uh, so if uh, you don't give any hint, the value would be 0, 0, 0, 001 is reserved. Uh, so either it should be 00, zero or 10 zero or 11. One one. So 10 zero tells you know branch is very likely not to be taken. And 11 one one is branch is very likely to be taken. So micro architecture will use this information uh, you know to uh, to uh, decide whether this branch is taken or not and he can speculatively execute the instructions uh, uh, which are there after the branch uh, or he has to or a uh, branch taken path or not branch not taken path so hardware micro architecture hardware will use this uh, feature uh, to you know speculative speculately execute the instructions or uh, even prefetch the instructions from where does he has to prefetch the instruction should be branch taken path or branch not taken path. Okay, so I, I uh, touched upon this uh, earlier. So condition register, condition register gets set whenever you do some kind of a comparison. So this is a 32 bit uh, wide register. They basically, uh, there are eight four bit fields in this register. Uh, they are they are called CR0 to CR7. Uh, so CR0, the first four bit field, this will be implicitly updated by any fixed point instruction which has a dot form. Uh, so when whenever there is an instruction with a fixed point instruction with dot, it, it basically we are telling you know you need to update the CR0. Uh, at the at, after you execute this instruction. So uh, all these instructions will update the CR0 and then one of the one of the example would be Stux. Stux is a, uh, you know, like a store uh, with a reservation. So if you have a reservation, then you will store. And then if the store Stux is successful or not is uh, is recorded in CR0. It's a dot form instruction and uh, the success of this instruction is recorded in CR0. Similarly, CR1 is uh, implicitly updated by all floating point dot instructions. So those would include uh, binary floating point, decimal floating point and vector scalar uh, instructions. Then CR6 is updated by VMX uh, instructions with the dot form. All of the VMX would use CR6. Then other CR fields, you know, they would be used by compare instructions. So there are uh, compare instructions where you can compare the registers. And they are also used by when you want to move something to CR itself, like uh, move to CR. You can also specify which field you want to move. So those instructions also use the other CR fields. So there are some instructions where you can modify the CR like CR and CR NAND, CR or CR NOR. So we all know the AND, NAND or NOR. So you can manipulate the CR, what, what the value is there in the CR, CR by using these instructions. And other way to modify the value in the CR would be, you know, you can do a move to uh, CR. And if you want to know what the value is there in the CR, you can also do a move from CR. And if you want to only read a particular field in CR, then you would do move from, uh, you know, like a, a MF or CRF. So that will only move a particular field uh, from the CR. Similarly, you can also move to only a particular field in the CR using a, you know, move to OCRF. So these uh, condition register, these bits also would be used by branches actually. So whenever you are branching, you want, you want, you would do a comparison where, when a particular value is there in the condition register and you can tell, you know, you will branch depending upon what the value is there in the condition register. We touched upon the count register. So branch can be, you know, like a branch can happen over the count count, uh, count register, uh, like like a example of a for loop where you know the count decrements and then you, you keep branching until the counter is zero. 
and uh, other way the count register is used is also you know you whatever is there in the address in the count register you can branch to that address the basically count register is used as a target address that would be another way to use count register then there is also a register called target address register it's somewhat similar to count register but uh, the, here uh, you know there is no decrement or anything you this register just holds uh, what is the target address address and you will just uh, brand you can use that register to branch off to that address branch to target address register then there is a link register this is similar to count and uh, 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 target address register where you can branch off to link register but then the, it uh, has uh, much more usage uh, like like i touched upon earlier all the subroutine calls uh, you know they use the link register whether to make a call or you want to return from a call so there are instructions uh, when uh, you know there is a branch and a link instruction which basically whenever you make a brand branch then you know the next address of that instruction would be basically loaded in a link register so what you would do is whenever you do a return as the as the link register is already loaded he knows where he has come from so he will branch off to the location from where he has come from fixed point unit so fixed point unit uh, there the operate there are different operations which happen in uh, fixed point unit fixed point instructions so the op operations are you know like a register to register so it could be and or subtract multiply divide like rotate shift compare select so these are all different kind of instructions we, which we if we, we if we take any high level language like c or any language we do all of these operations so internally all of them would be converted into assembly instructions like uh, add subtract multiply divide and all of this and these would be operated upon these these instructions would be uh, you know dispatched to fixed point unit and fixed point unit would be who would be executing these instructions then there is an instruction called trap. Trap is an instruction uh, which will generate an interrupt. Uh, you can you can tell you can ask uh, ask a program you know to trap if you if you if you think that is something which uh, should not be done. Like there is some condition like uh, if you expect some variable to not have a value zero and you want to trap whenever the value is zero. So here you get a program interrupt and then, you know, then that that's one way to trap the processor. So there is an instruction called trap. Then uh, there is a, there is an instruction called darn darn. So this will generate a del this will generate a random number for us. So this is, a, this is a, a very important. We know that whenever we are running on hardware, we want to uh, like uh, do some stuff uh, uh, which is uh, which where we require a random number uh, uh, to do something like suppose uh, you want uh, a program where every time he runs a particular piece of the code you want to give a different input to that uh, that piece of code uh, one way is you know you have to generate a random number using some software mechanisms and then you will feed that number into into these routines so that it takes a different path and you get a different results uh, so here hardware is uh, helping us to get a random number so every time you execute this instruction you get a new random number and this you can feed to the software where you know you want the in, you want the input as a random number then you also have instructions where you know you can do a move to and move from from a gpr to vsr vsr would be you know i would uh, touch upon it again vector scalar registers so you can move uh, stuff from gpr to vsr to and fro after fixed point unit we have floating point unit so floating point unit uh, ibm uh, processors power instruction set of you know of, uh, compliance with the ieee standard so uh, they they implement all the floating point uh, uh, 
instructions as per the IEEE standard. So we have different uh, floating point units. Actually, one is a BFP called binary floating point. So here, different kind of uh, uh, input numbers are supported. One is single pression and other is double pression. So in case of single pression, you have the operands as 32 bit operands, and uh, you know each register will have one operand, one one operand. And in case of a uh, double pression. The operand should be 64 bit operands, and uh, you know each FPR can have one double friction operand. And uh, all the binary floating point instructions begin with the letter F. So when you go through the instruction set architecture, it's easy to know you know if it's a BFP or not. So if you see it starts with F, it's a binary floating point instruction. And then there are 32 floating point registers uh, which can be used uh, to perform this floating point operations. And BFP is a single instruction, uh, you know, and a single data. Then we have a VMX or vector instructions. Uh, here, the the only single precision uh, numbers are supported, and uh, thirty two bit operands, and there are four operands per register, and uh, all these registers, all these instructions start with the letter V. And there are 32 VRs, and each VR is basically 128 bit. So that's the reason you have 32 bit op. If you have 32 bit operands, you know, there are four operands per VR. Then the next unit is a decimal a floating point unit, and even this is a single instruction, single data. And VMX is single instruction, multiple data. As we saw that we have four bit op four operands, so it's multiple data. So in case of uh, DFP, it's a single instruction, single data. Uh, here, uh, different kind of operands which are supported would be 32 bit, 64 bit, uh, 128 bit operands. So in case of 128 bit operands, uh, it's uh, actually uses uh, a pair of uh, floating point registers. So it will use uh, even odd pair uh, consecutive registers uh, to uh, even uh, register and then followed by an odd register. Then you would get 128 bit. Otherwise, whenever uh, 32 bit or 64 bit operands are used, uh, you know, we, the one floating point register is used and all DFP instructions uh, begin with the letter D and uh, a DFP instructions operate on the 32 floating point registers, which we have. And there are some quad word floating point uh, DFP instructions, like which use this 128 bit instruction, uh, 128 bit. Uh, uh, operands there, uh, the instructions start with the uh, letter Q. And then there is another unit called a vector scalar extension and a vector scalar instruction uh, extension unit is a SIMD single instruction, multiple data. And here a single pression and double pression both are supported in and here the registers are 128, uh, 128 bit registers and there are uh, 64 VSRs. And uh, whenever there is a single pression, he takes uh, four 32 bit operands. And in case of double pression, he, he takes uh, uh, two 64 bit operands as uh, input. And all these instructions uh, begin with letter uh, X. Okay, so uh, till here, it's uh, more of uh, what all units are there, what kind of instructions are there, what kind of registers are there, and that is uh, mainly book one at a high level. And then uh, uh, next would be, you know, uh, Power ISA virtual environment architecture, and this is something where operating system is what deals with the, with this contained content. So here, you know, mainly the the storage model is uh, dif uh, is discussed, and then their attributes, uh, and then uh, the instructions which uh, manage the shared storage. So there are uh, different kind of uh, storage model, like uh, it can be weakly ordered or strongly ac strong access ordering. Then uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, the caches and uh, how how are they, uh, how, what are their attributes, whether it's a write through or cache inhibited or memory current or your memory is guarded. And then there are cache management instructions. And when memory is accessed by different instructions, uh, whether it's accessed on the same thread or a different thread, 
you know or you have to synchronize those accesses so the help from the hardware to do, do that and then i would also touch upon sync and uh, you know eiao instructions then atomic access instructions So when it comes to memory model, so generally our uh, processors implement uh, uh, weekly ordered. So what does weekly ordered mean? So when when there are a set of instructions, like there are hundred instructions which are there, and then there are a lot of load stores. So access to different bytes can happen in any order. Uh, by this, what I mean is suppose uh, there is a store which is like first instruction is doing a store. And maybe 10th instruction is doing uh, store, like a first instruction is doing store to location A, 10th instruction is doing store to B. So the access to A, access to location A and B need not be in uh, programming order. So access to location B, which is accessed by 10th instruction, that access can happen before the access to uh, location A by first instruction. So that's the reason, you know, the, this is called weekly ordered and uh, access to different bytes can happen, appear in any order. So, and uh, uh, that's what is called weekly ordered. But then there is a hardware support. Uh, see, when, if, if those locations are not in any way connected, then uh, the program is okay to access them in any order. So those those two are completely different uh, locations and uh, you know they are not like your program doesn't depend on the values of those two locations. They are, the logic is not in any way connected, then you know it's uh, if it's uh, uh, weakly ordered and then uh, you don't have a problem and then it allows the hardware or to use this feature micro architecturally to give the be best results, like, uh, uh, you know, do the accesses very fast, uh, program to be very fast, and you get the performance out of it. But there would be a problem if there is logic in the code, uh, the software code, which is using these locations, there is some interdependency how the code is using. They want, uh, like the first instruction access, whatever happens, they want that to happen before the, you know, next instruction access then there is a support given by hardware they can use uh, instructions like uh, eieio or sync instructions basically what if there is a sync instruction he will order this uh, uh, order this uh, uh, accesses which happen i'll again touch upon it uh, then other part to weekly ordered is if the access is happening to the same location like uh, uh, when we do a store to a and a store to b and this a and b are actually overlapping locations or in case they are exactly same locations like i am actually accessing the zero byte uh, you know of a certain page in both of these accesses then you know uh, the the accesses should be like a sequentially execution model like it should be in programming order and you don't require any string sync instructions here so what hardware does in weekly ordered is only when the locations are not overlapping or only when the locations are not uh, uh, same uh, then you know he would he would not guarantee us the order in which these accesses can happen but whenever the the locations are same then you know he hardware does the accesses in programming order and if you do, if you want the accesses to be in order of those which are also not uh, same, the locations are not same. Hardware does provide the support. We can use use the sync instructions. Okay, memory attributes. So there are uh, different memory attributes uh, that are uh, used by hardware. They are basically called uh, WIMG. Uh, in short, like uh, W for write through, I for cache inhibited, M for memory code core, and G for guarded. So, what does write through does? So, if the value is uh, uh, one, whatever access happens to the cache, it's immediately returned to memory. That's what is called write through. But if it is zero, then writes to cacheable memory are not immediately returned to memory. So what cache we, we know is, uh, you know, like the buffer of the memory, which is uh, which is on the hardware, which is not far off like memory where you can access very quickly. So uh, this write through will decide how we want it to be. So obviously, if you want to, uh, if you set the write through to one, uh, you are basically 
you know, writing everything, whatever is there in the caches to uh, memory immediately. So you, you would have a performance impact on it. And if you are using a zero, he will only do a, uh, you know, write whenever it's required. And when is it required? Suppose the same location is being accessed by some other thread or some other core. He knows that, you know, who has the recent copy and then that, that particular thread from that cache, you know, it is returned back to the memory. So, uh, right through, uh, you, you, you can gain performance uh, when, when you have zero but then you have some certain application or certain way where you think you know one is what you want you cannot live with the not writing to the memory immediately or you know that this particular uh, you know uh, location whichever is being accessed would be accessed by a lot of threads a lot of codes uh, uh, simultaneously and very fast then you can go with uh, uh, right through so that you know it's really written off to memory and others can access it then the next attribute is uh, cache inhibited. So cache inhibited is something where you some some accesses where you, you uh, if a cache inhibited is zero, you are telling you can uh, cache those locations. Those are cacheable. And if it is one, you know you don't want to cache those locations. And generally, you know IO is where it goes into cache inhibited uh, wherever IO is involved. Uh, so you generally don't cache it. Like, like if there is an MMIO location on the some adapter or some network card or PCI card, then you don't want to cache it because uh, the, the register values or the memory map values will keep changing and that's where cache inhibitor is used. And then uh, memory coherent. Uh, so th this is like a, uh, whether the memory is kept coherent by hardware or is not kept by hardware. And this is like a coherency uh, which is there. And uh, these days uh, we talk about uh, coherency with accelerators too, whether you know you want to keep the co uh, accelerators memory when you know whatever is accessed by accelerator and hardware is coherent. Generally, I/O memory is not coherent. You don't uh, keep it coherent. But then we have a uh, CAPI hardware where you know we have a coherent uh, interface, and that's uh, innovation uh, from IBM, which is present. Uh, and then uh, Peter of C also has uh, touched upon it. Uh, you know, you can work on those accelerators, CAPI, where the memory is kept coherent. Otherwise, uh, generally, all the memory is co kept coherent, other than I/O hardware. But if uh, you want the IO part also be coherent, one one way would be go, go through CAPI. But it depends on what all you can do. But that would be one option. Then there, there's another attribute called guarded memory. So guarded memory, you can uh, set uh, this attribute to one. What happens is all the accesses uh, to that particular location would be in order. And then they wouldn't speculate. Uh, but if you set this value to zero, then you know non-overlapping accesses are permitted to occur in any order. And then uh, the order, the 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 memory is you know speculatively accessed. Okay. Then we have uh, lax and stux. These are reservation instructions. Uh, as we know, there, the, when we write programs, there would be critical section. Uh, we need uh, some location to be accessed uh, only by one thread, though it's a shared memory. So that's where uh, these instructions are used. So we may be writing a semaphore or a mutex, but internally hard, on power hardware, what it gets converted to these instructions. So uh, load, Lux is a load and reserve, and there are different granularity of these instructions. Uh, you can do a load and reserve on a byte, half word, word, double word, quad word. And then uh, uh, these, this reservation gets uh, set. Uh, and then whenever this one particular thread uh, executes this instruction, you get the reservation set. And once the reservation gets set, uh, you know, like uh, when, when you do a store, if your thread has the reservation, then that store would be successful. Uh, that, that would be store conditional and then and even in store conditional, you have all those granularity of instructions like byte, half word, word, double word, quad word. 
and then uh, store when you do a store it's uh, you know like uh, when only when it's you have still the reservation because all the threads are trying to uh, do a store here they they try to do a load and reserve and then also a store if uh, you know whoever gets the reservation uh, it's like you know you are you are looping like a, on a semaphore or a mutex so that's the situation here and whenever store is successful your cr0 gets uh, updated and that's uh, how you know that you are you are successful you got the access you can go ahead and if you don't did not get then you will uh, continue this lo loop of uh, you know go back and do a load then get a reservation and then do a store Uh, then uh, we have this uh, sync instruction as i said uh, you know when you want to uh, basically uh, see that uh, all the accesses whichever we want to be performed in a certain order we can achieve that by using a sync so it's like a barrier so any after if there is a sync any accesses which are there after sync would be only performed uh, after all the accesses which are there before sync are uh, you know completed uh, and uh, sync instruction is also uh, it it does this uh, you know like uh, uh, this this kind of uh, barrier part for both cacheable and non cacheable accesses also something if you are accessing even the io uh, this this sync instruction would take care that all the preceding load stores are completed before the ones which are after the sync and the, this sync can be performed uh, you know between load and load uh, load and store store and load and store and store all the all the four combinations okay uh, moving on to interrupts we know that uh, you know we get uh, we we have our uh, different kind of interrupts which are which are present and interrupts is one way where uh, you know instead of busy looping on something you know you take an interrupt and that's how you get the performance on the hardware uh, so there are different kind of interrupts there could be synchronous asynchronous so asynchronous would be something uh, where you are doing something on your program you get an unrelated interrupt that would be asynchronous that's that means like uh, whatever you are doing at that, that particular instruction is executing it's not related to that and you get an interrupt it could be uh, like a you know like a decrementer uh, who want to who wants to do some process scheduling or it could be an external interrupt or some doorbell uh, and you know all of those kind of interrupts uh, whereas synchronous synchronous interrupts are something uh, which happens due to the current instruction which uh, you are executing so you if this instruction is accessing some unaligned memory or this instruction when it is accessing some memory it doesn't have a you know translation to that the location he is trying to access so he takes an interrupt then you know application program may be executing some instruction but he doesn't have a translation to a particular real address he wants to access like a load or store then he would get an interrupt then uh, you know operating system would go and install translation and then it would come back and then you know application program would uh, be able to access so the, those would be synchronous interrupts and in power hardware whenever you know uh, interrupts happen there are a few registers where uh, you know it would be important like uh, SRR0 and SRR1 and uh, if it's a normal interrupt if it's an hypervisor interrupt then it would be HSRR0 and HSRR1 so SRR0 would contain the effective address uh, from where the interrupt is generated. So you suppose you get a page fault interrupt. When you go to page fault interrupt, if you want to know, you know, from where you have come, SRR0 is the one which contains the address from where you have come. And uh, similarly, uh, there is an MSR register called uh, machine status register. And whenever there is an interrupt at that particular point, whatever was the machine state register, that that value is present in uh, SRR1 register, which can be accessed by the interrupt handler. And MSR basically tells, uh, you know, like uh, what is the machine state, whether, uh, you know, translation is on, translation is off, whether the hardware runs Little Indian, Big Indian. In case of power hardware, generally both the modes are supported little indian big indian but it may depend upon the operating system you are running uh, but otherwise from hardware perspective both the modes are supported and uh, you know uh, similar uh, different uh, different stuff like that all the uh, 
status register of the hardware would be present on the MSR. And then the, there are uh, uh, two instructions, like uh, in case of operating system, there is an instruction called RFID. Basically, it's an instruction you execute when you want to return from the interrupt handler, and then there is an HRFID. So whenever there is, whenever RFID is uh, executed, what happens is whatever is there in SRR0, uh, you know, that, that gets, uh, 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 the program would uh, jump to whatever value is there in the SRR0. And similarly, whatever is there in SRR1, that value is basically returned into MSR whenever RFID is done. Similarly, when HRFID is done. So that's way, that's a way to give control back. Uh, like you got a page fault interrupt and you want to return from the page fault interrupt, the place you want to return back, you know, uh, would be present in SRR0 when you are doing an RFID. And when RFID is uh, performed by uh, uh, hardware, we will return back to the instruction from where page fault has occurred and, uh, you know, SRR 0 to program counter is what, uh, you know, one can imagine it as. So I have uh, briefly uh, touched upon the open instruction set architecture. It should help uh, when we go through the open ISA and then, you know, go through different books and uh, understand the instructions registers. Then I will briefly touch upon uh, RISC V. So RISC V architecture uh, these days uh, is used, uh, you know, like uh, predominantly. Even RISC V is open source. There are uh, different, uh, uh, you know, word lengths which are uh, supported in RISC V. One is RV32, RV64, RV128. When it comes to RV32 and RV64, you know, like uh, uh, there are incremental incremental instructions at architecture, but uh, mainly RV32 and 64, there are a lot of instructions at architecture which are frozen. But when it comes to RV128, is something which is uh, still being developed. So the instructions at architecture is not frozen. So there is uh, still, you know, some improvements being done, things are being added, and this is all open source. Open source. And there are, uh, you know, 32 uh, general purpose registers in uh, RISC, and uh, the instructions are variable instruction length. So each instruction length is not, is not constant. And uh, there are three privilege modes. One is a uh, machine mode, M, M mode it's called. Then there is a supervisor mode, and then there is a user mode. U mode. U mode would be something like a, uh, uh, you know, like application programs run. Supervisor mode would be operating system. M mode would be something like a firmware kind of a code uh, which which would run. And then there is a control and status registers uh, for each of these uh, privilege modes, like a M mode, uh, supervisor mode, and user mode. And uh, in risk uh, risk five, actually there is like a, a different kind of ISA extensions. So you know it depends on what one wants to implement in their processor. Uh, so they need not have everything. So they have uh, subsets or they are called extensions. And standard name naming convention is RB stands for risk five. Then uh, 32, 64, 128 uh, tells uh, you know their machine word length or what is the register length. And then they have different kind of extensions, uh, and some of them have, uh, you know, like uh, uh, he given here. I stands for integer. Then uh, M stands for you have, uh, you know, integer multiplication and division. A stands for there is atomics also present. F is a uh, floating point, single pressure floating point. D is double pressure floating point. G is general purpose. So whatever is there till now, I M A F D, you know, would be general purpose. So somebody may, uh, if they if they take all of that, there would be you can just use G and uh, you know you you would be uh, conveying the me meaning to them. And then uh, C C is a sixteen bit uh, compression instructions. Then H H is uh, if, if there is a hypervisor extension also, and uh, V is a vector instruction. Then uh, coming to uh, RISC V and open instruction set architecture, RISC V is of T and uh, open ISA, and it's an enabling you know 
a lot of processor in, innovation and then the there is an open standard collaboration which is happening and if you want to learn more about uh, uh, you know risk 5 uh, this would be the site uh, you know where uh, it would be accessible and uh, similarly uh, open power isa is a very high performance instruction set architecture a lot of servers are implemented based on open power isa as my previous speaker has uh, given a chart when you know uh, which processor like p7 p8 p9 and as all no p9 is a hardware which is uh, working on a supercomputer there are supercomputers based on p9 hardware so it's a very high performance instruction set architecture and then there is this instruction set architecture is open source and it's accessible you know in the following uh, site and there is a lot of information on this open power foundation arc uh, site if we want to know more about it Okay, so I think uh, this is all I wanted to cover. So I think uh, we have some time. I wanted to have some time at the end if there are any questions. So I'm open to questions. Okay, uh, so sync instruction. So sync instruction. Uh, suppose there are like uh, in your in in a program, uh, we we are uh, uh, we have lot of loads stores. Uh, there are a lot of loads and store instructions and the way we are using uh, the the this uh, the results of the load and store instructions suppose there is some dependency suppose i am uh, loading a particular variable called x and if i want to use that x to calculate the result in some operation suppose i am doing a multiplication on x or something of that sort or a division or i'm i'm using it as a parameter to get a new value called uh, y but then there is a, some other variable also y is dependent upon like uh, you know and there is an interdependency between these two locations which can be accessed so if you do a sync instruction in between, you know, you want two instructions. Suppose you want location A and location B to be accessed in order. After location A is accessed only, then you want to access location B. Then you can use a sync instruction in between. And uh, the reason sync instruction is required in between is these locations A and B are not same locations. You are not accessing the same location due to which you need a sync instruction because what hardware does is whenever the locations are not same locations or not overlapping uh, locations hardware does some optimization he does does uh, you know speculative access of the memory caches uh, so that you know you get a better performance so what he does is he can access location b earlier to location a but due to whatever reasons in our program if we are writing code such that you know only after reading a you have to read b location then you can place a sync instruction in between so that you know your access happens hardware accesses those locations as per your requirement whatever program wants to do and uh, sync instruction can be done between a load and load load and store store and store you know all those four combinations and this instruction also does this ordering between cacheable memory and non cacheable memory like if you are even doing an mmio or an io access even there if there is a load and store there is some load and store to cacheable memory and there, there is some load or store to non cacheable memory even then the sync orders those uh, you know uh, access of those locations so that's uh, about sync 
then coming to chord word dft instructions that is true all of them start, it, it's not end they start with q uh, okay from where to start if we need to study risk v uh, so uh, the risk v uh, the site i have mentioned that would be a good place to start that's an official site actually risk v dot arc would be the site and uh, if you want the instructions at architecture then it would be risk dot arc technical and then you know specifications this would be the site Okay, uh, I think thanks. I think we have a few minutes uh, left, but I, I don't think so. There are any questions. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, then I think uh, uh, you guys can take over. Uh, sir, there are some questions in the Q and A window. Uh, I answered them. Are there any okay. more? Okay, on slide eighteen, how many letters minimum or maximum need to write in the end? Like. Uh, like uh, RV32 uh, GI. No, you see, you wouldn't write GI because you know G G means general purpose. So integer is already present in that. So you know I am A F D, right? So you are you you are telling G to tell that all of this instruction set architecture is already present. So you already have integer, you already have multiplication and division, you have atomics, you have floating point, you have double pressure. Then you want to call it as G. So G can be used with anything like C, H, V, which are not present on the top. I don't think so. These are like how many letters are there, like a min or max, because this is basically, you know, like a, uh, you are telling uh, uh, which instruction set architecture extension you are using. So if you are using IMAFD, uh, you can use it. Actually, you can use G instead of IMAFD because you need not use uh, so many letters. Uh, that that site which I have uh, mentioned uh, for risk we would be the site from where we can start off. That's where the architecture is defined, and ISA is the place where uh, you know you you need to start off uh, for uh, knowing the architecture. So risk we dot arc technical specifications. This would be the site which will give you the ISA, and in general risk we dot arc the parent site itself has lot of information about risk we. Risk five, sorry. The weekly ordered memory model, is it the OS that controls the access or the hardware? So the, the, the it's like, a, uh, it's like the hardware, uh, which does this hardware will decide whether the hardware is weekly ordered or, uh, uh, you know, like a, whether, uh, uh, it is strongly ordered. So some processors give uh, you an option to be strongly ordered, or, but by default, lot of processors go for weekly ordered mo modeling memory model. Only some uh, some processors uh, will do a strongly access order. Some processors won't even implement strongly access order. And when they implement strongly access order, they give the programmer uh, an option to you know use the strongly access order so in as a strongly access order as the word means the way the accesses are done you know they are ordered like a programming order you know you will order the the location the loads and stores and uh, you would lose on the performance uh, but then you know you need not use sync and all of these uh, instructions 
uh, but then you would lose on the performance. So, but for performance, uh, all the almost all the processors implement weekly ordered memory model, and it's the hardware which it implements, and not the OS that controls. But if uh, uh, hardware is giving an option for strongly access order, there would be an provision. You know, it would it should uh, it would be available for uh, AP uh, for you uh, application programmer. But obviously, he has to go through OS and hypervisor. Uh, uh, to uh, to do it like uh, in case of uh, some processors, they may uh, give the strongly access order provision through the translation. You know, you can tell through the translation this particular memory location which I'm accessing. You know, I want it to be strongly access order, uh, but uh, you will lose on performance. Weekly ordered where where you will gain performance. So it's simple. You know, when uh, two locations are not actually any way dependent and in our program, you know, you can allow them be accessed in any order you want, and that's how you can get performance. And most of the times, uh, the different locations we access in uh, our uh, uh, instruction stream or our application program would obviously not be dependent. Only few locations would be dependent. And if those could be, you know, and generally, if uh, you are writing a high level language, compiler will take care of it. You know, he will apply things and stuff like that. Uh, it, but it depends whether you are doing some IO programming or a device driver programming or certain programming where you have inserted assembly instructions, then obviously we have to take care, the programmer has to take care of the memory model. So in conclusion, uh, you know, the uh, uh, weekly order is done by the hardware uh, and uh, processors may give an option uh, to do strongly access order and that would be uh, through, you know, operating system. But the main decision is uh, from the hardware. Uh, access to a variable A and then B, which is 10 instructions apart, who decides whether to access a variable B or not. So, uh, see, uh, we know that uh, in this uh, server processors, uh, what happens is, uh, there are a lot of instructions which are pre prefetched and then you know you would be actually speculatively ex uh, accessing these instructions uh, one way is one easy easy way is suppose there is a branch instruction uh, you know that for a branch instruction there is a branch taken path and not taken path and uh, till the hardware really goes and executes uh, you know that branch instruction we do not know whether we would take a branch taken path or not taken path but in micro architecture in hardware there are a lot of algorithms you know which uh, which predict whether the branch will take a, will be taken or not taken so depending upon the prediction hardware will go and do a prefetch of uh, instructions and then he will speculatively execute the instructions so the results of these instructions are not committed but they are speculatively executed so in this process you know in before accessing the variable a he will go and access us, access variable b because he is doing a speculative execution he is doing a uh, prefetch you know all of this uh, uh, instructions so a uh, lot of server hardware uh, can go and do a prefetch of uh, instructions which are in hundreds like he can ask he can do a prefetch of uh, 200 instructions 300 instructions it depends upon you know how many buffers hardware has and uh, you know what his pipeline is but the server hardware does a lot of stuff like that to uh, give the performance so that's how the, the access of the variable B can happen before variable A. And in case, uh, you know, there is no interdependency and those locations are not being accessed, then, you know, he will hardware will just use it, right? So that's how it will happen. So because of uh, micro architectural, uh, you know, like uh, features of the hardware, location B can be accessed before location A. Okay, I think we answered all the questions. Thank you. Thank you once again for this opportunity and uh, all the best for future uh, uh, program. Thank you.
uh, thank you so much, uh, Vinod sir, uh, for the wonderful session. Thanks. Uh, so to all the participants, now we'll have a break of 15 minutes. So please do not get disconnected. Uh, stay connected. We'll again start the session from 1215. So we have a break of 15 minutes. And uh, pa participants, please note that you have to join the Cisco WebEx platform through your registered email ID only. As uh, this is the email ID because only your registered email ID will be used to track your attendance. So if you join with any other email ID, so you